As an actor, he achieved notoriety in his first film, Primal Fear, and garnered an Oscar nomination. He followed that role with memorable and award-winning work in such films as The People vs. Larry Flint, American History X, Fight Club, and The Illusionist. Outside of acting, he is an environmental and social activist, and in 2010 he was named the UN Goodwill Ambassador for Biodiversity. Hello, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Oscar nominee and Golden Globe award-winning actor Edward Norton. When reading a script, how do you know it's right for you? Um, I, I don't always, and in fact, <laughs> this will sound really like ironic, but the um, but sometimes sometimes the ones that I don't think I'm right for are the ones that I end up thinking were the best experience. Um, almost to the point that I I've started I've started moving toward things that I have a bad reaction to at first. And that, that doesn't mean, you know, a, a crappy script, but right. I mean, I, I mean, I mean it, that I've learned that if I have an initial resistance, if I, if I think I'm not right for this, I don't think I can do that. I'm not really sure that I do that well. And sometimes even I don't understand this. I don't understand what it is that those, those can sometimes end up being the ones that you should do because you're 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 going to move into a, a a zone of discomfort in a way, and it and it produces interesting work sometimes. Is there an Edward Norton style of film, or not really? I hope not. I mean, yeah. I hope I hope not. I it, it would be hard for me to. Um, there, <laughs> that people have brought up to me the idea of um, you know connective tissue of the, thematic connection between some. Films I've done, but um, you know I can't really find the pull between like Death to Smoochie and Fight Club. So as long as I can, <laughs> as long as, as long as there's ones I can, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think so. One time I went to um, the best answer to that question that I've was given to me actually um, was I went I went to the Shanghai Film Festival once, and um, they were running running a pretty substantial series of films I had done and uh and I liked the selection they had picked they were a lot of ones I really liked and um and I saw that there was there was a banner they had a banner under it in the program and and I and I turned to someone I said what is what does that actually mean like it, and they said oh that's the that's the title of the of the film series of your films and I said well but what does it say and they said it says the search for the spiritual center in the new youth generation <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> so pretty good to yeah, take. <laughs> so I was like, I started laughing. I, so that's what I'm going to say from now on is my films are about the search for the spiritual center in the new youth generation. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty big for a business card, though. Yeah, exactly. So. I had heard that when you looked at Stone, the script for Stone, that you read it, put it away, wasn't taken by it, came back to it a few times, and then got involved in even rewriting it. So what makes me wonder in all of that process is what is the nugget in there that draws you to it. If at first you didn't get it, and then you reworked it, why I that think, script? Yeah, I, you know, there's never, there's never to me a set process on a film. Every film's different. It's like every, every film's a different chemistry experiment, and and there is a different, um, there's a different balance. Scripts come in at different levels of readiness and and clarity, and directors have different personalities, and and you know. It, it's there's such a jumble of things that are involved um, in the collaborations on films, but films are always collaborations. So, so um, I, I can't say there's anything that, that any pattern. But uh, in this case, there were, there were two things. First off, I had made a film with John Curran, who who directed The Painted Veil, and I I um, I so enjoyed working on The Painted Veil with him. I became good friends with him, but I, I admired what he did with the film. I, I had liked his other films, 
and I wanted to work with him again. And we we had said to each other when we finished Painted Veil, let's you know let's let's start let's keep an eye out. And uh, and and this came through him. He had he he became very fascinated by certain ideas in it, and he was a, he gave it to me first. And the first time I read it, I just didn't get it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see the depth that he saw in it, um, but because we're friends, you know. So I gave him my notes. I wasn't saying to him like categorically, like this is junk, throw it away. I just sort of wasn't quite where he was on it, and I, and over, and I gave him my thoughts. He went and did work. He he was started working on it, and he started um, challenging it and and stretch, you know, adding things and changing things, and then he brought it back to me. And there was this kind of you know, process of back and forth over time, and eventually it got to a place where I started. I started to have a sense that I knew what he was what he was getting at more. And some other things. Uh, the other the other thing that happened was the economy tanked. Um, and I know that sounds like a really weird thing to say, but but all of a sudden, some of the things that John was saying about the kind of film he wanted to make started to have. A, a new level of relevance to me. I thought that he was getting at things that were very, very much at the heart of some of what this our whole culture is going through, and and that's a trigger for me definitely. Whenever whenever I get a sensation that a piece might really be digging around at the experience of the moment, that yeah. that starts to become a a big pull to me because. The films I've enjoyed the most and that have meant the most to me in my life and, and the films that I've made that I think have achieved the kinds of things I got into films to make, I would say almost uniformly are ones that, that meet that standard. They, they, are, they are about the times that we're living in and, and they're wrestling with what's difficult about the times that we're living in. Somewhere. I read a quote that you had said, and I'm going to terribly misparaphrase right. it here, but um, where... The films that are the most financially successful are not necessarily the films that people remember, and that the films that stay with us and become part of our fabric of our lives are those films that have something more to say. I, I think so. I think man, many of the films that that any student of film was would cite as the, the 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 ones that had real impact or that became lasting documents um, or really seen as as art. Uh, were not are not the the same as the list of the most successful films since 1970. You know what I mean? Right. Um, that's not to say that some successful films aren't fantastic films. They, they are, but um, but I think that it's not to me. It's not the criteria that that is that defines like what the long term life of a film is going to be. And how do you balance out that struggle if you're Hollywood and you want to turn the profit, but you want as an actor, to make the longevity well, but the H- Hollywood's an idea. Hollywood's a Hollywood's a projection. You know, Hollywood's an idea of of an industry, but but it it's not some unilateral. It's not some beast. It's not some monolithic industry where everything we all do is is somehow interacting with Hollywood. Stone Stone, by way of example, was independently financed. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and it's not. It, I wouldn't call Stone a product of of Hollywood per se. It wasn't made by a big studio. It wasn't. It's not being put out by a big studio. Um, so, so I think that um, you know, and, and the world the world has changed in many ways uh, that are positive. I think for films, because for, for eclectic films or or artier films or. Um, because DVDs and Netflix and um, now the internet, there, there's a a film is able to sustain a, a life in a way that 30, 40 years ago it absolutely was not. And um, and while we may not have what you know what you had back then, where if Easy Rider becomes a cult hit, it can run for literally like 56 weeks or something <laughs> right. like that. We have we have something. Uh, equally potent and and maybe even broader reaching, which is that like a film like American History X that came out and did you know I think barely ten million dollars at the box office, which which was considered fine because we made the film for so cheap, we made it for half that. Uh, but at the same time, that's that's become this you know I 
I think someone told me it was in the top 30 rentals of all time at Blockbuster. You know, it's yeah. it, and and when you go through those kinds of experiences enough, it, it it has a settling effect on on the pressures you feel that come from the industry because you realize that you realize that 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 there's this way that films live and form their own direct communication with audiences and that sometimes those ones are the are the deepest ones um that the that the kind of the commercial distribution model is not the only way yeah. for a film to penetrate and become meaningful and and if you got into the films to try to make some of those kinds of films then it's good to know that is there a relationship between you and your body of work do you look at them in a because I, I see the way you talk about them affectionately, American History X, Death to Smooch. Well, I, I mean, I'm, to me, they're more reference points for, learn, for things that the, 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 I, I reference sometimes as a learning experience. Like you go, you go through, you, 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 you learn about the way people interact with films and you, it affects how much you, you uh, suffer from or, or feel liberated from kind of the commercial pressures. Yeah. But I don't, I don't really... Um, I don't really really interact with a body of work. I, I don't I don't make choices based on on that, or um, and and nor do I have a nor do I have like a a goal for for some way I would like them all to stitch together. Mm-hmm. I think that. Mm, you know, artists in many different fields that I admire are often ones who I think have had many chapters in their lives, have have um, moved through different phases and periods of of interest and focus. And and I, to me, to me, acting primarily, but but even filmmaking is um, one of the one of the one pleasures of it to me is that it's this like it's this incredible opportunity at at, at like. It expands your life, you know. I mean, e- the, the things that I work on are this opportunity to go places and learn things and investigate other people's experiences. And you, you know, you 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 get this incredible insight into human experience and the breadth of it. And you get to learn all these details of strange worlds. And yeah. and it 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 has a um, it's my absolute favorite thing about it. And I think uh, if anything, I I look at making films on a selfish level as an opportunity to just explore more of the world yeah. on a non-selfish level you know what you're trying to do is 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 recognize things that might be of value to other people and say okay we're going to channel that i'm, I'm going to be the conduit for that or i'm going to figure out how to how to share that out to with other people you know yeah. Now take me all the way back, the beginning. Six years old, first acting, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I had a, I definitely, I got interested in the whole thing in the first place through a, a like a, a babysitter of mine <laughs> who was herself an act in her teens and in an acting, in a drama program, you know. And I, I think I saw her in a play, but, but. In and around the same time, you know, my my parents were my parents were really into theater and film. They weren't they weren't actors or performers, but they they attended things all the time. They I, I, I even as a very small child, I remember my parents going to the theater, and I remember my dad pulling me over to watch you know watch Sunday afternoon films or something. And and I and I I was very caught up in the in the the magic of all that. A true or false, just total side note, your grandfather, one of your grandfathers invented the concept of a shopping mall. Is that true? <laughs> it's, that's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that is true. Um, he, my grandfather, my mother's father was a very famous, not just a, a, a developer, but a, he, he was most famous in some ways as an urban, urban planner and urban philosopher. He, he was one of the great thinkers on American cities and urban development, and um, I mean, people still teach courses about his thinking and writing on on city planning. And um, uh, but he was he was one of the first people to develop you know enclosed shopping centers, uh, mm-hmm. and I think he was credited with being one of the first people who referred to it as a mall. 
Yeah, and you grew up in one of his communities, correct? In Columbia, Maryland, yeah. That's cool. Anyway, back into the career. Just <laughs> trying to find out if that yeah. was true or not. So, and then in your teenage years, you went to a drama club or camp. You know, it was, it was really just a, dr- it was a drama arts school that was run in our community. Um, you know, it was like the same way that I took tennis lessons or, or like took guitar lessons. You know, it was like a thing I would go to after school. So is there a point where you realized, I can make a living out of this? This is something I can do career. I think it went through phases. I mean, when I was a, when I was a kid, I really thought about, I thought about, you know, the movies and plays. And I don't know that I even had a sense of myself as wanting to be a professional. I just thought it was fun. Um, in college, I kind of moved away from it all entirely. I thought about doing other things and then got back into theater but I was even living, I, you know, after school, I, I, I was living in New York and I was doing other things entirely, but I kind of kept gravitating back toward auditioning for plays and writing plays and writing a screenplay with a friend of mine. And, and it took me, I don't know, it took me a couple years to kind of admit to myself in a way that I was, that I was interested in it enough to actually try to do it professionally. Yeah. And, then, and then there was, you know, kind of that... I wonder how you do make a living. How do, how do you make a living at this? Or how do you get work right. doing this? And that took me a few years to... In there somewhere, Edward out. Albee comes into the picture. Yeah, Edward Albee the, is, you know, I think to this day, one of our greatest living American playwrights. Um, I loved his work. I, I was, you know, a huge fan of his plays and of the films Who's Afraid, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and... Um, uh, I auditioned for a play. He no, he saw me in a small. He saw me in a downtown play I was in in New York, and uh, was very complimentary. Stayed after to say very nice things to me, and um, I found out about a new play that he had written that was being cast, and I auditioned for it. So that was one of my first. I think that was my first paying paying job as an actor. Did he direct it or just write? The no, movie? he just wrote it. Just wrote it. I'm always interested in what he puts into his plays and what he gives to the actors to go and do the show. Is it just what is the written word? Do you find your character in it all be, or is there more explanation to them? I think, well, his plays are very diverse. So, um, you know, I mean, he's written plays about uh, a pair of lizards that encounters a pair of humans on the beach. So I have no idea what what his notes were to Frank Langella when he did that play on Broadway. But... um, but the play we did was very um, abstract. It was like, there's that Pirandello play, Six Characters in Search of an Author. It reminded me of that. Um, and he said interesting things to us about, you know, he said, look, I'm not, I'm, he, said, I'm not, he said, I'm not looking for character other than you. You know, he said, if you are in the play, it's because I think you have a quality. That's what I want for that. So... He kind of said, "Let's not tart it up too much." You know what I mean? <laughs> let's not let's not get too decorative. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I laughed at that. I remember thinking that that was uh, interesting because I was so inclined to hide behind character somehow. And he kind of said, "Don't don't bother." And and I wouldn't call it hiding, but what I see in your body of work now is that these completely separate, unique creatures you create and. I, I, looking at your body of work, I can't tell you who you are as a person because each one can be so different. And so it's funny that early on, yeah, the advice was just be you. Just for that play, I think. Right. Just for that play, I think. Um, I mean, interestingly, he saw me in a uh, he saw me in a, a play by the playwright Brian Friel, uh, the Irish playwright, and it was an it was an Irish play, and I th- I, I think I remember he at I think he thought I was Irish, so. Um, <laughs> I think he was surprised that when I wasn't. Which um, brings up another question for me. Primal fear. I heard that when you auditioned, you convinced them you were Southerner and... Well, I, 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 half, I, I told half-truths <laughs> when I got engaged with that. I was always a believer that... Um, I still believe that, 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 that it's very easy to puncture the bubble of, of illusion that goes on. And I think um, I, never liked, I never liked this. There was a thing... 
of, you know, come in for the audition and then chit-chat and then do your thing. And I always thought, what a great way to ruin everything I'm about to do, you know? Yeah. So I used, to, I used to try really hard back in those days. It was an instinct I had to sort of say, like, let's, let's, not, like, let's not ruin everything right before we get started. And if I couldn't do that, when sometimes I realized I wasn't going to be able to sort of control the, the, the way that I got to audition, then I just sometimes I started thinking, well, you know, screw it, I'll, I'll, I'll control it by not giving them anything other than the thing I want them to see. And so I would go in, I would go in as close as I, you know, hanging already sort of in character, and I would try to hold that until we were done. Yeah. And, on that case, and in that case, on that film, you know, I do have roots in the South, I have roots in Kentucky and in Virginia and in places like that. The character in Primal Fear... I figured I would locate it in things that I knew and understood pretty well, and I, and I just thought there's no reason there's no reason they need to know anything about me other than that. Looking at a list, your filmography, I'm surprised at how early in your career was the People versus Larry Flynn. Yeah, that was I a, thought that was much. You know, you think, but that's yeah. pretty early. <laughs> third, that was the third film I did. Yeah. yeah, reaction to that film for you? I love that film. I think that's one of. I mean, I. Uh, as a fan of Milos Forman, not not my own films, I would say, I would say it's one of his th- really really great ones. All of I like all of his films, but I would say for me, uh, Cuckoo's Nest, um, Amadeus, Ragtime, um, Larry Flint. I think those are those are. That's a he, he's one of the masters. In fact. That was another example, actually, early on in my career. He, I got, I got sent that script, and I, um, I didn't like it at all. Uh, with no knock to the guys who wrote it, but I, I didn't get it. I didn't, I, I just didn't. And I, and then I heard Milos Forman was going to direct it, and I, and he was one of my <laughs> heroes, one of my, one of the people. Like, pro- I think I literally had a, I think I showed Milos that I had a journal entry from years before. Just. I was so so admiring of his films. I, I, I think I'd written something like, I would, I, if I could get a job carrying lights for that guy, I would carry lights for him, you know. Um, and uh, and I, I, was, I was so interested in what he saw in it, and it was, a, it was another example of a director saying, no, 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 just don't, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not seeing, the, it's much more than the script, it's, it's bigger than that, it's deeper than that, and his articulation of it was what pulled me into it. Another question I need to ask, another film I want to ask about. Most horrific thing I have ever seen in a film, and it still stays with me to this day, is the curb scene in American History X. Yeah. How do you get into a character such as that? Well, I think that for me, that, that film, you have to, a film like that, you have to have a very specific conviction that, there's, that, you're, that you're telling that story for a reason that's that's positive, and and I don't even mean necessarily uplifting, because the film's not very uplifting. But but I think David McKenna, who's my friend, and I, he, he wrote David wrote the script. Da- David and I, in talking about it, I we were you know we were very clear with each other that what we were going after was like a tra- you know a tragedy. And, and, a, and a film that that made the point that there's a consequence to ra- to rage to um, letting anger dominate your life that anger has a corrosive and destructive effect and and if I didn't feel you know you, you need to f- you need to build out from a positive intent with a film like that you need to say like we think there's value in looking at this and yes the characters you know really intense but it's about a transformation and it's about um, complex themes. So, um, you know, I, I think that we knew that, the, the people who were making the film knew that, our crew knew that. So you, you create an environment, you create an environment of, of people who believe in what you're doing and, and that gives you sort of the, the kind of private safety zone to get into the, more, the darker or more savage aspects of a... Of a character like that and um, and uh, you know we didn't make that up I mean we weren't trying to be gratuitous uh, David David had pulled a clipping about that 
an incident. I think that's what makes it so startling and upsetting yeah. is that you're not going over the top. You're giving people what's out there. Yeah, it's very yeah. much. We, we we tried to be pretty rigorous um, with it, and uh, and I think you know to me the number of people that we've had come up to us write us uh, about the impact of the film on them has affirmed to us that we were going after good things. I think you know Amnesty International was using that film for years as part of their discussion on hate crimes and things like that and. And um, so I always felt I, I felt it was it was risky, you know, in some ways. But but we we were pretty committed to the idea of of a contemporary tragedy, you know. It, and at the time, I mean, at the time, I remember talking to David, saying like, you know, Othello and Macbeth, and you know, uh, if you go back to like Oedipus, I mean, these are these are stories where everybody ends up dead. You know what I mean? They don't I'm, end. I'm going to end up dead if we don't end this now. <laughs> this is where I'm going to frustrate the audience because no, we've okay. barely begun in your career and we're out of time. Uh, Thank you so much. No, Such pleasure. a pleasure. Yeah, Edward Norton. Thanks. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.